radiation won't hurt you unless it gets into your body. And it gets into your body either through inhaling it or through eating food that has it in it or drinking liquid that has it in it. It's not like gamma radiation, which can affect you at a distance. Now, the main difference between the high-level waste and the low-level waste is not the degree of radioactivity, but rather the penetration of the radioactivity. The fact about high-level waste is that it gives off a lot of gamma rays and beta rays and very little alpha rays. And so you can be damaged just by standing near it. It's an external hazard. The low-level radiation is not that much less radioactive, but it doesn't give off penetrating radiation. It gives off this alpha radiation for the most part. It does give off a bit of beta and a bit of gamma also, but the main hazard is from the alpha radiation. Now, uh, by the way, when, when, John, when, when Ernest Rutherford uh, came to Montreal, Ernest Rutherford is known as the Newton of atomic physics. He's the guy who basically taught us almost everything we know about the physics of radioactivity. Uh, and he came to McGill in 1898, McGill University in Montreal. And he's the one who, his research is at Montreal, taught us that every radioactive substance has a half-life. And what that means is, that the atoms are not, the atoms are popping, they're exploding, but they don't all explode at once. They explode in, according to their own timetable. And what happens is that if you have a gram of radium, you have to wait a certain length of time before half the atoms have popped. And it turns out to be 1,600 years is the half-life of radium. So that means if you waited 1,600 years with a gram of radium, you would then have half a gram of radium and half a gram of something that was not radium that has changed. And if you waited another 1,600 years, you might think, well, it's going to all be gone. But no, it isn't. The way it works is that half of what remains disappears, and you're still left with a quarter of a gram. And if you then wait another 1,600 years, then you're left with an eighth of a gram, and so on. And by the way, if you wait 10 half-lives, you can see, of course, that it's going to take forever to get down to zero at this rate. Um, but practically speaking, if you wait long enough, it's going to be so small that it won't be uh, very noticeable or very harmful or very considerable. Um, generally speaking, it's interesting to know for any radioactive substance, if you wait 10 half-lives, then it, it will be reduced by a factor of 1,000. So for example, if you started with a ton of radium, that's a lot of radium. If you started with a ton of radium and you waited 16, if you waited 10 half-lives, which is 16 thousand years, then you would have, what, one gram. And if you waited another 16,000 years, that's 10 half-lives, then you'd have one milligram, a thousandth of a gram. And if you waited another 16,000 years, you'd have a microgram. And these girls basically had less than one microgram in their bodies when it was discovered that they had so much bone cancer and so on. In fact, half of a microgram was considered a large dose for these girls the ones who got bone cancer and leukemia and so on. And that's why, uh, that's why Dr. Martland said that alpha particles seem to be the most damaging of, age, of the agents known to science. And that's still true today. It turns out that the alpha-emitting radioactive substances are the most potent cancer-causing agents known to science. There's no other carcinogens, cancer-causing substances, which are nearly as potent as these particular alpha substances. Now, in the case, oh, by the way, I might also tell you, and this is a rather important thing, is that, is that radium itself, can you see that? Is that, can you see that from back there? It's a little hard to see, no? Maybe, uh, well, okay, I, I would have to use colors. Probably if I hadn't used colors, you could have seen it. Anyway, this is uranium up here. Uranium is a naturally occurring radioactive substance which had absolutely no use up until 1938. Up until 1938, it really, there was no market for uranium. Nobody wanted it. If you told somebody you had some uranium, they'd say, ho hum, who cares? Um, however, uranium is radioactive and it disintegrates and becomes a new substance called thorium. And that is also radioactive. And when it disintegrates, it turns into another substance called protactinium. And that's also radioactive. And it disintegrates into uranium, another type of uranium, uranium-234. It's a different type of uranium. And then that disintegrates into a different type of thorium. And then that disintegrates into, that's radium. That's the radium. 
That's the stuff that Marie Curie found. When Marie Curie found that radium in that rock, you could be sure that that rock also had uranium in it. But she wasn't after the uranium, she was after the radium. Why? Because the radium has a half-life of 1,600 years, and therefore it's disintegrating a lot faster than the uranium, which has a half-life of 4.5 billion years. And this means that ounce for ounce, radium is a lot more radioactive than uranium. And that's what she was after. She was after the stuff that was really giving the punch to this radioactivity. Um, now, how did Ontario get into this picture? Well, Ontario got into this picture due to a man called Gilbert Labine, who was involved in a company called El Dorado Gold Refining, which was located at Port Hope, Ontario. And uh, they decided back, this is way before the Second World War began, they decided that radium at that time was selling at $100,000 an ounce. And they decided that radium was a good business to go into. And they found a mine up in the Northwest Territories at Port Radium. And they started mining that ore to get the radium out. Now, of course, that ore also contained uranium, but they weren't interested in uranium because it was of no use. So what they did was they took the ore down to Port Hope, and they had a refinery there. And what they would do is extract the radium and they would sell that radium for big bucks. And that's how Canada got into the radium business. Well, it turns out that the competitors started flooding the market with radium, and the price plummeted from $100,000 an ounce to $50,000 an ounce, and then to $20,000 an ounce. And by the time the Second World War started, they were out of business. The mine was closed up, the refinery was closed up, and there were piles of waste material all over Port Hope. Some of it in the harbor, some of it just piled up here and there around Port Hope left over from this radium refining and not particularly well looked after. Now, of course, those waste materials contain all of these other radioactive substances because the only one that had been removed was the radium. And they didn't even remove all of that. They could only remove so much of it, so there was still radium there too. Then along came the year 1938. And in the year 1938, two German scientists working in Berlin discovered that, you, that there was something besides radioactivity, and it's called nuclear fission. Nuclear fission is different from radioactivity. It's a process whereby you can actually split uranium atoms almost in half and release a great deal of energy in the process. And as soon as this news was broadcast abroad, scientists around the world realized that it might just be possible to build an enormously powerful bomb by using nuclear fission and the only one substance in nature that will do this, and that's uranium. So all of a sudden, there was a market for uranium. They needed it for the bomb. The question, of course, now, me my, meanwhile, of course, Hitler had invaded Czechoslovakia. Hitler had invaded Poland. By the time 1939, 1940 rolled around, Hitler had taken over a good part of Europe already. So the question is, where are you going to get the uranium from? Well, guess what? At Port Hope, they had a radium refinery, and they've got all that waste lying around there. They must have a lot of uranium. So what happens is they came to El Dorado. They came to the Canadian government, in fact, and they said, why don't you, why don't you nationalize this company, make it a crown corporation so that you can control it for security reasons, and take those wastes and get the uranium out because we better get cracking on building an atomic bomb or else Hitler's going to beat us to it. And so the uranium for the world's first atomic bombs came from Port Hope uh, to get it out of that waste. And they also, by the way, had some uranium stored on Long Island that came from the Belgian Congo. So there were two sources for the uranium, Canada and the Belgian Congo, but all of it was processed at El Dorado in Port Hope because that's the only place in North America where they could do it, the only place that was geared up to do it. Now, after the war, uh, the market for radium disappeared because people decided that it was too dangerous to work with. Too many people had been killed. Too much radium jaw, too much bone cancer, too much leukemia. They stopped using radium. And nowadays, radium is discarded as a waste product. And what they do instead is they mine for uranium. So whereas before they were mining for radium and throwing away the uranium, now they're mining for uranium and throwing away the radium. And the radium is by far the more dangerous of the two. So what they're now doing is they're taking this stuff off the top and leaving all this stuff in the waste. 
Now, what you have from Port Hope at the present time, you've got uh, some 200,000 tons of waste uh, lying around in ravines. Um, and some of that stuff was from the radium days, and some of that stuff was from the uranium days. And some of it has a lot of radium in it, and some of it has a little radium in it, depending upon the historic period when the wastes were produced. But it all has radium in it. And of course, if it has radium in it, it also has polonium because polonium-218, polonium-214, and polonium-210 are all byproducts of radium. When radium disintegrates, it turns into all these other substances. So it turns out that 85% of the radioactivity in the rock remains in the waste. And only 15% of the radioactivity gets taken out in the form of uranium. And that's the waste which they're hoping to get rid of. Um, I might also tell you something else that's very important, and that is that when radium disintegrates, what does it turn into immediately? What it turns into immediately is something called radon. And radon is a gas. It's a radioactive gas. So what you have is you've got this radium atom here. Suppose I get radium in my food. Like, let's take those girls who were painting their dials. How do they get the radium in their bodies? The way they got the radium in their bodies was this. They would wash their brushes and the brushes would be clean and they'd get dry and they'd get a little fuzzy. They go in in the morning to start work and they put the brush in their mouth to put a tip on the brush so that they could do the fine work which they had to do to paint the dials and the small numbers on the dials. Otherwise, you need a very fine tip to do that. And it looked to them as if the brush was clean, but just as it looked to Marie Curie that the beaker was empty. But in fact, it wasn't perfectly clean. There was radium there. And so every time they put the brush in their mouth, they were getting a tiny, tiny bit of radium into their mouth, which then would be transmitted through their saliva and eventually find its way to the bones and so on. So these girls were unconsciously building up what's called a body burden of radium. Their, their body was acting as a kind of a repository for these tiny amounts of radium. And by the way, even though, I mean, do you have any idea what a microgram is? A millionth of a gram. Imagine taking a gram and distributing it among a million people. You know, a microgram is a very small amount. They had less than a microgram in their bodies, and yet, when they did autopsies on these girls later on, they could find radium everywhere in their skeleton. They could find it in the jaw, they could find it in the leg bones, in the arm bones, in the, in the everywhere. So even though there's a tiny, tiny amount of radium, it managed to get itself around pretty well. Now, when the radium disintegrates, it turns into radon. And radon is a gas. And because it's a gas, even inside the body, it tends to go up into the, into, the head, into the head part. And it was that which caused the head cancers. It turns out the radon gas would migrate upwards. And by the way, one way you can tell whether somebody has radium in their body is to give them a breathalyzer test. You get them to breathe into, into a bag, and you measure the bag for radon gas. And if there's radon gas in their breath, then you figure there must be radium in their bodies. And that's one of the ways that they try and tell how much radium you might have in your body. So this radon gas would collect in their sinus passages and in their mastoid air cells and irradiate those cells and cause cancer there. Now, it turns out that we knew about radon for a long time because the rocks that Becquerel got came from Czechoslovakia and there were stories in that region of Czechoslovakia going back, and these were written reports, they weren't just rumors. There were written reports going back to 1546 was the earliest report that we found so far. In 1546, there was a report of massive deaths in this region from lung diseases among the miners, and nobody knew why. And this, these reports persisted over hundreds of years, and it was very well known that about 80% of the miners died of mysterious lung diseases. By the end of the 19th century, uh, it had been clearly shown that 50% of these deaths were actually lung cancer. Now, 50% deaths from lung cancer is very high. And remember, this was, uh, you know, even before perhaps as much smoking as we have today. They were smoking, though, so there was some smoking, too. But 50% is very high. And, uh, and the other, the other deaths were from other lung diseases, but not cancer. By the 1930s, it was very well established that the thing that was causing the lung cancer in those miners was radon. What happens, you see, is that underground, when you mine a rock which contains uranium, the rock is usually a hard rock. 
Now, inside the rock is all this stuff. It's all there. It's been sitting there, just percolating away for billions of years. You go down into the mine, you start crushing the rock and digging into it, and what happens is you release this radioactive gas. And so the miners breathe the radioactive gas in the mines, and uh, that's what was giving them the big dose of radiation to the lungs. Now, it turns out that radon has a very short half-life, 3.8 days, which means it's popping really fast. It's, ver it's, it's more radioactive in the sense that it's popping at a faster rate than radium, very fast. Now, radon disintegrates very quickly into a series of other substances, most of which also have short half-lives. And these are called the radon daughters, although lately they've called them radon progeny in deference to the sexist overtones of calling them daughters. Why not call them radon sons? Um, but at any rate, so now they call them radon progeny. And these radon progeny are radioactive isotopes of polonium and lead and bismuth. bismuth and that's what does most of the damage. Because basically the miners breathe in the radon gas every time they breathe in, but then they breathe it out when they breathe out. But the radon daughters, or radon progeny, they stick to the lungs because they're solid. So as you breathe in the gas, there's these tiny little specks of solid material which are invisible. You breathe that in too, and they stick to the lining of the lungs, and then you get quite a dose of alpha radiation to the lungs. And that's what causes the uh, tremendous damage to the lung tissue. Um, by the way, there's also lead-210, which has a half-life of 22 years, and polonium-210, which has a half-life of 138 days, and this is now regarded as one of the principal culprits in cigarette smoking. It turns out that, uh, that one of the principal reasons why cigarette smoking causes so much damage to the lung, as well as so much damage to the uh, circulatory system, which causes strokes and heart attacks, it turns out that it seems to be very closely related to this lead-210 and polonium-210 in the tobacco. As you smoke the, to as you smoke the tobacco, the lead-210 and polonium-210 in the tobacco is vaporized and you take it into your lungs and it stays there. Now what they found is that when they do operations on people with arterial sclerosis and they remove the plaque from the arteries, they find in nine times out of 10, right where the plaque is, they find there's also alpha radiation. And that alpha radiation, and they also find that in the lungs of, minor, uh, of smokers, when they do autopsies, they find that they have uh, a much larger concentration of polonium-210 and lead-210 in their lungs. And it's from the tobacco, in fact, that it gets there. Um, how does it get there? Well, that's a whole other story. It's an interesting story, and maybe I could, I'll just briefly say that what really happens is that the tobacco leaves have a, they have a very thick canopy of leaves. And the tobacco plant, on the leaves, they have hairs on the underside of the leaves. And these hairs have little glandular heads, which are sticky and resinous. And it turns out that the radon, which is given off by the uranium in the soil, builds up under this canopy and just hovers there. Radon is heavy. Radon is about, um, well, almost 10 times heavier than air. So it tends to stay low down. And when it uh, builds up under this canopy of tobacco leaves, the, the radon is popping and producing radon daughters, radon progeny, I have to get used to that. I've been saying radon daughters for so long. Radon progeny, the radon progeny sticks to little tiny dust particles and dewdrops and so on, and then it attaches themselves to the leaves so that when you harvest the tobacco plant, you harvest the polonium-210 and the lead-210 along with the tobacco. You see the radon disintegrates fairly quickly into lead-210 and then into polonium-210. Anyway, that's another story. I think we'll, we'll have a break uh, for coffee and uh, we'll have one minute for you, right? <laughs> <laughs> we'll take a break for 10 minutes. Good job, buddy. Okay. <laughs> All right, I guess, uh, I guess we're going to resume. I don't want to talk uh, too long because I know it's uh, a little tedious just listening. Um, I would like to touch on a few other points, however. The main reason for going into this history is I would like you to be uh, sure in your mind, and there are many good references and books that will uh, confirm this for you. There's a good book that was brought to my attention just during the break, which I read and which I recommend. It's called Blind Faith by Penny Sanger, um, and it's about El Dorado and Port Hope, and it's a very good book. It's well written. It's easy to understand. 
And one of the things that's particularly interesting about it, in fact, I have a quotation here from the book, if I, but I have to dig into my briefcase to get it. If anybody's interested, I can fish it out for you. But she quotes from a 1945 newspaper article, an official of El Dorado showing a reporter of the Port Hope newspaper through this room and saying, now, doesn't this look safe? But it's not safe. He says, if you slept over, I, he said, if you slept overnight in this room, you'd get a terrific dose of radiation from the radon gas that's given off by that material. So if anybody tells you that they did not know about the hazards, that's hogwash. They knew these hazards long before World War II. And it was very well known and it was very well documented, which makes it even harder to understand how El Dorado could have allowed people in the town to use this material to build their houses with and to use the, allow the school to use this material to build the school with. And it wasn't until 1975 that, uh, that they discovered radon levels in the school cafeteria in St. Mary's School in Port Hope, which were higher than the levels permitted in the mines. And they had to evacuate the school, close the school, and uh, try and get rid of the radioactive material that was causing this problem because of course, if you use radioactive building materials, which have radium in the building materials, naturally that radium is going to be producing radon gas, which is going to collect in the air of the building, and which is then going to produce radon daughters, which is a very potent cancer-causing agent. Now, when I say the amount that's permissible in the mines, let me also tell you that in 1982, um, the Atomic Energy Control Board published rather reluctantly a study which they had commissioned from an epidemiologist at McGill University who is now one of the world's renowned radiation epidemiologists. His name is Duncan Thomas. But Duncan Thomas, this was the first job he was given. Uh, and it was the only time the Atomic Energy Control Board has ever asked for an independent outside expert who has nothing to do with the nuclear industry to look at radiation hazards. And I dare say it might be the last time they ever do it too. And what he did, they told him, they said, listen, we want you to look at radiation hazards for radon gas for miners, and we don't want you to look, use the industry's figures. We want you to go right back to the original data. And so what he did was he went back to the Colorado miners who worked in Colorado mining uranium, the Czechoslovakian miners, the Elliott Lake miners, the Newfoundland miners who worked in what's called a fluorospar mine and who died of a lot of radon-caused lung cancer in the fluorospar mine, and also zinc and lead miners and other hard rock miners in uh, Sweden. And basically, th these were miners, all of whom had had their radiation levels measured in the mines, and it was radon gas that we're talking about, radon and its daughters. And he showed, using this evidence, that, uh, that the present permissible levels of radon in the mines would be expected to produce approximately a quadrupling of lung cancer in the miners. That's what's considered a permissible level. A permissible level would cause a quadrupling. Now, lung cancer right now in Ontario for males runs at about 54 deaths per thousand males over a lifetime. I'm talking about lifetime. If you took a thousand males and tracked them from birth to death, 54 out of a thousand would die of lung cancer. If you quadruple that, it comes to over 200 per thousand, which means more than one in five. Uh, that's a that's a pretty hefty, pretty hefty death rate. And as a matter of fact, the British Columbia Medical Association said quite, a, uh, um, uh, I have a little pamphlet here. The British Columbia Medical Association became involved in this because they wanted to open a uranium mine in British Columbia. And so they got involved and they published this thing called Health Dangers of the Nuclear Fuel Chain and Low Level Ionizing Radiation. It's an annotated bibliography done by medical doctors and endorsed by the British Columbia Medical Association, mostly having to do with alpha radiation and mostly having to do with radium and radon and the things that are in the Port Hope wastes uh, that we're talking about. So if that's what it does to workers, what does it do to civilians? Well, this is a book that I uh, authored back in 1978. And what this book deals with is radon in homes in Elliott Lake. Because at that time, they were undergoing a big expansion in Elliott Lake. They were increasing the town by a factor of five. And they were building whole new subdivisions of homes in radioactive areas. And in fact, the radon gas that was coming into these homes was quite significant. Now, instead of building the home somewhere else, 
and having the miners truck to work or something, they decided to build these subdivisions in contaminated areas. And I was asked to testify at these hearings. So what I did, at that time, I might add, I knew nothing. I really knew nothing about radon and about the hazards of radon. I was a total ignoramus. But I was a mathematician by training. And so what I did was, I simply looked at the government's figures, which the government itself published in evidence at the hearings, showing the deaths in uranium miners in these different uh, uh, countries. And I looked at the exposures, and I looked at what they were allowing in the homes as a permissible dose, and I said, hey, if you use what we call arithmetic, you arrive at the conclusion that you are saying it's OK to allow a 17% increase, a 31% increase in lung cancer just by living in those homes. Now, that means an extra 17 deaths per thousand. That means an extra 17 deaths per thousand over and above the 54 that I mentioned. And who says that's acceptable? Now, as soon as I said this, I gave this evidence, and it's all written up in this, in this pink document, which I'm leaving with the committee here. As soon as I said this, I was immediately attacked by the nuclear industry saying, oh, you don't know what you're talking about, which, by the way, was true. I didn't know what I was talking about. All I was doing was using arithmetic on the government's own figures. Um, since that, the British Columbia Medical Association looked into it the following year, and they came to the conclusion, based on all kinds of other evidence, that in fact it would increase the lung cancer rate by about that amount. And about one year after that, in 1981, the National Academy of Sciences in the States published a report called the Beer 3 Report in which they confirmed that it would cause about that rate of increase in lung cancer. And the year after that, this paper that I was mentioning by Duncan Thomas was published, and he said that not only would the permissible levels in the mines cause a quadrupling, but the permissible level in the homes would cause a 40% increase. So I was under by about 10%. So the reason I'm telling you this is because I personally find it appalling how the authorities in Canada have consistently downplayed, ignored, and covered up the hazards of radiation. And it's still going on today. For example, in the United States, the radon hazard in homes has been so well recognized that the American government has now recommended that every home in the United States should be tested for radon, just as a matter of pure public health. Because if there are elevated levels of radon in the homes, the people should know about it. And there are various things that can be done. You can, for example, install fans to blow the radon out of the basement before it gets into the living quarters or whatever. Uh, you can put sealants on the basement floor to try and prevent the radon from getting into the home. Uh, or you can move <laughs> uh, uh, and may hopefully uh, have something done with the house. But the point is that the American government has been so convinced by the overwhelming evidence on this matter that they have advocated it as a routine matter that radon should be checked in homes. The same thing has happened in Sweden. Canada refuses to even go to that length because they say, basically, we've been saying for years it's not a problem. How can we change our mind now and say it is? Um, I think that that's really appalling. I think it's appalling that they allowed homes to be built in, in uh, Port Hope with radioactive material and then acted surprised when there were these high radon levels in the homes and millions of dollars worth of corrective action had to be taken. I think it's appalling when they were told by letter from a professor of nuclear engineering at the University of Toronto that there was radioactive contamination around Port Hope 10 years before they did anything about it. And the reason they did nothing in the meantime apparently is because there was no public outcry. I'm also appalled, if you look back, and the, this is, you might say this is old history and this is ancient history, but I'm afraid that we're still seeing it happen today. And I mentioned the radon gas in homes as an example of that. I'll give you some other current examples as well. Um, I think that our authorities have not